Hello and welcome to CS631 Advanced Programming in the Unix Environment. This is week 12, segment 1. In this week, we'll cover a bit of a hodgepodge of topics. We'll cover a few topics grouped together as Advanced I.O. and we'll conclude this week's materials with a very high-level introduction to basic encryption in the Unix environment. But first, let's revisit syslog. As you may remember from our video on daemon processes from week 10, we had identified a need for processes without a controlling terminal to communicate events to the system administrator or the users, and we had mentioned the use of syslog for this purpose. So why do we need a special daemon that logs messages for us? Wouldn't it be easier to simply have our process open a log file at program startup in append mode, then write data to it whenever it needs to, and then close it upon exit? Seems simple enough. Now the thing is, a daemon may want to send different messages to different places, or perhaps it's not the daemon itself, but the administrator would prefer if, for example, debugging statements went to one file, while important messages about certain critical events went to another file. So no problem, let's have the process open two files and write the messages there as needed. Problem solved. But sometimes the process wants to also write to a terminal, if it has one anyway. And certain events may be so important that they are written to the serial console. Well, all doable. But now consider that this is a very common pattern. All demons on the system will have this, or similar needs. Not only do they want to write to their own files, sometimes you want to collect errors or warnings from all your demons in the same file. So now you need to coordinate access by multiple processes to shared resources. And so the mappings between processes and file increases and becomes more complex. But not only that, you also have to consider that now every process has to have write access to the log files in question. And most daemons run with a dedicated user, so you need to grant granular write access or allow the daemons to run with higher privileges to write to all the different files and resources. So that gets messy quickly, as you can tell. Here, doesn't this look nicer? If we had a central logging facility, then we can abstract all the messy work of handling files and all that away from the processes. You know, do one thing and do it well, then allow the daemon processes to simply make a few library calls. Now, that central facility still requires a write access, but all the individual processes do not any longer, which also nicely allows us to run them with very limited privileges. So in a way, we can think of the central logging facility of a daemon itself that juggles all the different messages submitted to it by the different applications. Here's a video of syslogd, a daemon that requisitioned its groove back in action. Messages come in and are swiftly filed into the right files. All right, let's see what this actually looks like. Here, under var log, we see a number of files that are regularly and frequently updated. The names are reasonably self-explanatory. There's a mail log, an auth log, a log file for cron, and a file for generic messages. Different files have different permissions, depending on whether the messages received are considered to be possibly sensitive in nature or not. So let's take a look at the entries in the auth log. Here, we see a number of messages from sshd and some from sudo. The regular messages are not sensitive, so we can look at them as a normal user. We'll notice that the format across the files is consistent, with a field noting which process logged the message. Let's see which processes all have been logging information. We extract the fifth field from the file and then count each instance. Okay, so a bunch of syslog, NTP, DHCP, CD processes. Let's try to get rid of the process IDs. There, that's better. So now we see we have around 10 processes that log messages, with the most messages coming from the kernel, followed by DHCP, CD, then NTPD. If we repeat this from all the log files, we see a few more daemons. Oh, 
hopefully showing the usefulness of having a central logging facility instead of having each one of these demons implement all the same logic. How does syslogd know which messages should be sent to which of these files? Let's look at etsy-syslog.conf. This file shows that there's a simple mapping of messages of certain types of priorities to log files. We'll see in a few minutes how we can log messages ourselves. But let's note that there are several ways that messages can be delivered to this central logging facility. The kernel itself can submit messages via the log function, allowing it to not have to implement actual logging logic itself. Any process on the system can make a call to the syslog library function, which we'll see in a more detail in a minute. But in addition to that, that's actually quite cool, syslogd can also accept messages coming from the network, usually UDB port 515. This is really useful. Imagine you have hundreds or thousands of hosts. You don't want to have to go to each host to investigate what happened on each. It'd be much easier to collect all the logs from all the hosts in one central location and then look at those messages in one place. Syslogd allows for this to happen. So altogether, syslog kind of looks like this. Each of the mechanisms by which messages are accepted allows syslog to process them in a uniform manner and then distribute them according to its configuration and write them to a file, send them to a user, or itself send them to another host. With all that, you can build a large-scale, complex message logging system for your infrastructure. But let's look at how you as a programmer would use syslog. We have two calls to look at, openlog and syslog. Openlog allows you to influence the behavior of the subsequent calls to syslog. In order to differentiate your messages from those logged by other processes, you can prepend a string to each message. We've seen that in the example where each daemon process uses its name for this prefix message. You can further specify a number of logging options, such as to log the messages to the console or stand it out in addition to the files, to log the process ID, etc. Next, you specify the so-called facility, which is used by syslog to determine where to route your message. Syslog itself is then called whenever you want to log a message. It hands the message to the syslog daemon tagged with a given priority, allowing the daemon to separate important messages from those that are informational only or used for debugging purposes. Let's illustrate the use of these library functions with an example. Here's our main function, where we call openlog. Specifying the program name as the prefix, asking syslog to print messages to the terminal with the process ID included. We pick the user facility to identify our process as a regular user process. Then we install a few signal handlers, and if we are to ever exit normally, close the logs as part of our usual cleanup. Our signal handler then calls syslog for each signal it receives, using different priorities for each of the signals we're catching. Okay, here we go. We hit control backslash to send sigquit, and it is printed on the terminal with a process ID. But let's see if it also found its way into the log files. Yep, there it is. Let's try to generate the same signal again. followed by SIG info. We can generate SIG info by hitting Control T. Note, by the way, that on BSD systems, sending SIG info to a process automatically triggers some information about the process to be printed, but our signal handler still logged its message. Now. Let's send it sig user one. We do this from a new shell. That too gets logged. Now let's try sig user two. Hmm, nothing happens. Let's try again. 
If we switch back to the program, we see that it received a signal and syslog triggered the login to the terminal, but nothing shows up in our logs. Let's send it say quit again. There, that was logged in the file. But also note that syslog added this statement here, last message repeated three times. That is, syslog is smart enough to detect duplicate messages, and rather than write those to the file, it will wait until a different message comes in. So if we send sigquid a few times, followed by sigquid2, we see them logged over here like this. Now, let's take a look at the configuration of syslog. Let's separate our messages into a different file by specifying user notice to go to var log user messages. First, we need to create the file. And then restart syslog D. We note that syslog D itself logs messages via syslog. When we now start our program again and send it the sig user1 signal, we see that it still logs to var log messages. But the message is also logged to the file we specified. That is, we see that syslog has the ability to allow logging to multiple files at the same time. Now, recall that we log the messages for the different signals using different priorities. and anything matching notice or higher will be logged to the new file. But if we send sig info, this information is not logged to the new file. Even though, of course, the signal is received. And per our open log directive, was logged to the terminal. Sending sig user 1 again, we don't get another message in our file since the message was just repeated, even if sent from a different process. But syslog d reports in varlog messages that the message was repeated. If we send sig info, that isn't locked because info is of a lower priority than notice, and we only instructed syslog d to lock notice or higher. Sigquid, for example, was locked. Since this central logging facility is rather useful, we can not only log things via the library functions, but also via the command line. For that, we have the logger utility, which provides a simple interface to these library functions. For example, we can log a message with a local zero facility and a level of info. Or we can log a message in the user facility. As before, if it's below notice, it won't make it into our separate file, but higher priority messages do get delivered.
finally, we can send a message of level emergency, which will be delivered to all logged in users on that terminal. As shown here. These messages are still logged to the file var log messages in addition. Okay, time to summarize. Syslog has been around for a while. It's been the de facto standard for system logging on Unix systems since the 80s. Syslog has been standardized since then in RFC 5424, which includes the definition of the network packet format. By default, Syslog will use UDP on port 514 for network connections. Although nowadays, you may also see Syslog traffic be transmitted over TCP or wrapped in TLS. Some newer versions of Syslog, such as Syslog NG or RSyslog, have added further enhancements. But amongst a number of large-scale organizations, it's popular these days to use a different message relay service, such as Elasticsearch or Solar, for example. However, it's worth noting that there is a whole lot of equipment out there that simply cannot use anything different from standard RFC 5424 format UDP to port 515 packets to relay messages. Network equipment comes to mind. Either way, Syslog is a very convenient service that exhibits many of the properties of the Unix philosophy and is, as we've seen in our code example, rather easy to use. Give it a try. Thanks for watching. Cheers.